with your hair? Woof, woof. <laughs> You're right, mate. Oh, he's got such sights to show you. Yes. Glad he has, yes. <laughs> yes, I'm doing. You know me. I'm always doing all right. I actually got a shout out at work because I'm always smiling. You know, even in the face of utter despair, I'm always smiling. I actually genuinely think I might be psychotic. Yeah, I just mm. people saying, Ashley, you shouldn't use the word cunt all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's what I do actually have a tiny filter on that. Um, it's the tiniest, tiniest of filters. Once all the kids are out of the room, it's cunt this, cunt that, cunt everything. Um, yeah, I suppose it would help if there weren't so many cunts around, really. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's their fault. It's, yeah. it's their fault for just being cunts. That's all it is. That's all it is. Um, anyway. well, gosh, we've started off well, haven't we? Yeah. Well, you know, our new family orientated shows are going really well. Yeah, start off with a cute little dog and yeah, move on to the season. <laughs> yeah. It feels like too long since we've last done this. Oh, uh, that's my fault. I'm gonna, it is my fault. I've got, I've, you know, I'm, I'm just behind with it. However, we're entering into a period of non working for two weeks, so I can catch up with absolutely everything and I can get everything back on track. For us to be kind of, you know, for us to be doing this on a more regular basis, because it has just been just craziness. I mean, yeah, is there's a lot. I didn't realise how much work there is in the third year of a degree when you're not actually doing that much, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You still yeah. just read it. I think it's because your mindset goes into this reading thing that you spend all your time just reading and then you suddenly realize you've done nothing else and you're not even reading stuff that, that's to do with your degree you've just fallen into that academic mindset it's quite uh quite an interesting thing to happen it's fun isn't it yes yes it is yes it is it would be much funner if if there were ways of financially compensating it so you can just keep doing it um but it won't stop now it won't stop now i might have to go off and do other jobs and you know, do a deal with the devil and all that kind of stuff. But the researching into things, the the theories on writing horror and writing in general will just continue. And it will, you know, onwards and upwards. That's what I say. Onwards and upwards. Because we're going to write something. We are right now. I will announce this to the world. We are going to do an adaptation of conversations with dead serial killers and we are going to put that on stage it is going to happen there's no doubt about it um how long it'll take to happen that we don't know but we are going to do it because um yeah i'm you know i'm just so into play writing and stage productions right now i think i'm more into stage production of horror right now than i am into horror films funnily enough which brings us now around quite neatly to what have we been reading this week well, actually, that's in. Uh, I'm putting this one in your court. Actually, this was your suggestion. So, Ash, what have we been watching this last period of time that has passed? Right. So, I've got to do a synopsis. Oh this. yes. Right. Yeah. Right. So we have been, <laughs> we have been watching Hellraiser. I may have got the names wrong here, but bear with me. Um, so we start off with Tim, victim. Okay. Um, <laughs> he's in foreign. And whilst he's over in foreign, he buys a little Rubik's Cube, um, but it's a special Rubik's Cube. And when you play with it, um, naughty people occur and, um, yeah, all manner of things happen. Anyway, um, they strip him of his skin and turn him into a big puddle of sort of like sick on the floor, um, which he's not happy about. Then we cut to Tim's brother and um, Mrs. Tim's brother. That's going to be a long name for me to remember. Anyway, um, Tim's brother and Mrs. Tim's brother um, have obviously um, a couple with family issues. Um, she's been um, bagging around. Um, he's either not happy about it or didn't get to play um, one of the two. We don't get to find out which. Um, they're moving into a new house where um, Tim is actually a puddle of uh, in the loft. Um, she finds puddle of uh. Um, she starts to reanimate him by bagging strange blokes and then murdering them. Um, he becomes more and more human, oddly making the fashion choice to go with sort of like white wife beater vests when he's still all bloody and everything, because that's not 
that's not going to come out with any level of washing. I mean, Vanish is good, but it's not that good. And this was well before the Vanish era. Um, yeah, anyway, she gets him to a stage where he's almost back to being human. And then... Um, and then... Uh, Tim's brother's daughter grabs hold of Tim's box and um, is Rubik's Cube's box, um, twists it, um, and the um, cenopods, cenobites, cellophopods, um, cenopods, the cenopods turn up and um, <laughs> they rip him back into being a um, fleshy lump of ugh again. Was that the same one you watched? Yeah, that was about that was about the same one I watched. Yeah, very close, yeah. very close. Yeah, yeah. I think there are probably a lot of spoilers in there as well as yeah, there, uh, might, that... there might there might be spoilers in both versions of the you know the both definitions of the word. Maybe I don't know. Um, yeah, the cenobites. Um, yeah, cenopods. Yeah, what did you think to it? <laughs> what do I think to it? It yeah. is one of my all time favorite movies, even though it has. <laughs> It has a lot of production problems in it. There, it is just one of my all-time favourite movies um, because it blew me away. Well, the first I am time I not it. surprised because it was fucking brilliant. Great film, wasn't it? Yeah, it was brilliant from beginning through to end. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to discuss this from a point of view of creativity because this was Clive Barker. Yeah. He wrote the original novella Hellbound Heart. Hellbound Heart. Right. Um, and then this was his directorial debut as a filmmaker, and he wrote the script. So it's one of those rare occasions where the adaptation is actually done by the author of the original work. Right. And then he directed it. And yeah, it's an, I think it's an incredible piece of work when you break it down into certain things that were the firsts. Um that sort of went on. In, there were a few firsts went on this film. Um, so from a creative point of view, from a creative filmmaking point of view, where are your thoughts on that? Um, my thoughts are that it's pure horror, and it's pure horror because it's got the puritanical vibe of sex is wrong and you're going to get punished for doing naughty sex. And obviously, um, Mrs. Tim's brother's... The woman. Yes, the woman um, shouldn't be banging around. Um, that sort of like, and um, as punishment for that, um, yes, things happen. Um, Tim himself shouldn't have been screwing around. And Tim, um, because he's been sort of like putting it where he shouldn't, um, because he's been indulging in sins of the flesh, his flesh gets quite severely punished by mm. the cenopods. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a, a classic case of horror should should have a moral bent to it. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, a few firsts. You no, know, this was the first time that that whole idea of a body being reanimated from the inside happened. So the whole bit where the blood falls onto the floor and it sinks into the floorboards and you see the heart coming back to life with all the sinews, nobody had ever done that before. That was absolutely fresh and new. And also this was before the days of CGI, wasn't it? So oh, yes, it's a proper gooey. Yeah, it's yeah. sticky animatronics. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah. the bit when he, he starts to reform and he's coming out of the floor, it's just incredible the way that they did that because that's like layer upon layer of like animatronics. Uh, you've got stop frame animation for the brain coming together. They actually had reverse waxing as well. So the way the brain initially comes together was actually a wax brain that they melted and then reversed the film. Right. Yeah. And they did it also when he puts his spine, you know, put the spinal cords are doing all that kind of thing on the top and it goes into the brain. That was also another one of those filmed in reverse. They couldn't get it to hit the spot. So they started in the spot and pulled it back out again and then just reversed the film so that you get that suddenness of the shot itself. Stunning. Yeah. Absolutely stunning film. And to say, never made a film before, didn't go through film school to actually have those visions and those ideas to be able to pull that together. Even, even the way that the guy, you know, like Tim's brother. Yeah. To refer back to in a second, but Tim's brother, when he cuts his hand on the nail that initially brings Tim back to life again, that is just 
gore fest. The way it cuts his skin and pulls against it is proper nasty. Yeah, it's lovely that part, isn't it? <laughs> That's it really the bit is. that makes me squirm more than anything else. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, even when you sort of like see fish hooks going through flesh and it's sort of like pieces of flesh that have been pulled away. Um there's a plasticity to those images where you're thinking, all right, I don't need to sort of like invest in that and I'm not going to wince. But him dragging his hand against that rusty nail, in that case, yeah. 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 My ring piece had tightened so much. <laughs> Just like, oh, yeah. No, it's a fabulous piece of work. I mean, it sits beautifully in the kind of setting the reality, going into the uncanny and then going into the weird. It does spend a little bit of time in the uncanny. You know, before just before he comes out the door, there's a whole the way that he films going through the house itself is beautifully done, as you know there's something odd going on. Um, but it's unusual in the fact that it explains it's it's what they would do in scripts nowadays. You know, when they say if you're writing a horror script nowadays, on the first page you have to tell the audience it's a horror. Right. This film does that. This film tells you on the first page, this is a horror. He gets obliterated in the opening scenes of this film. You don't know exactly why and how, but there's certainly, and you've got the turning thing with a bit of his face on it, and, you know, there's, there's, it's just really sets its stall out very early on that you are in for a gore ride. Don't relax. Yeah, and it doesn't let up at all. No. That opening scene, that opening scene is bad, and then the tension just keeps dialed up to 11 throughout. Yeah, even down to I mean, I love it when she um, when she starts killing the blokes to, so that he can feed, you yeah. know, to bring him back. Um, you just think, Jesus Christ, you know, what what on earth? Because it was on the eve of their wedding, wasn't it? That the brother in law turned up, gave her a bit of a scene to to use a kind of more old colloquial way of talking about carnals and sordid yeah. frightfulness. Um, but in such a way that it obviously completely and utterly warped her view of what to expect for everything for the future. That yeah. that when he turns up as a complete mess, she's still willing to do anything just to get that cock back. Yeah, which again is sort of like um, which ties into the whole notion that it's a cautionary tale. And oh well, if sex is good, yeah, perhaps it's too good. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's like the heroes in this movie are the husband who's not getting any or the daughter who's all virtuous oh he's not the he's 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 not the hero i don't think the husband i refer, I refer back to him we'll go back to him in a second actually because he's quite an interesting actor um but yeah the, he's i don't think he's the hero in this he's kind of almost like the tragic character in this isn't he i would describe it as a tragedy in for his character definitely he's not the guy from deep space nine is he no he's the guy from dirty harry yeah, and Deep Space Nine. Well, did they have him in Deep Space Nine? Because he no. couldn't get a job after Dirty Harry. He, he hasn't had many lead roles. He might have gotten... Oh, Deep Space Nine is after Hellraiser. So it's after Hellraiser that he went into that. Until Hellraiser, he couldn't get a part because he played the part in Dirty Harry of the guy that had all the kids on the bus. Yeah. And scared the shit out of all the film producers. And nobody wanted to hire him because they were frightened of him. Yeah, he was... He played it beautifully, yeah. <laughs> so, in, yeah... And this one, you see his range, don't you? Because you actually see his acting ability as being a really dweeby, kind of, you know, almost effeminate bloke. A bit like me. A bit like me, to be perfectly honest with you, right? He's, um, yeah, he's henpecked and he's... Yeah. Yeah, he's... All right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. <laughs> and then when Tim puts his skin on, he becomes someone else. He becomes, you see it in his eyes, his eyes change. And it's like, what a stunning piece of acting that is. The way he changes that person. You can tell instantly when when the daughter comes home, that's not daddy. Um, interesting side note about that guy. Um, my wife, Tracy, um, has got a habit of being able to identify people stupidly easily whilst we're watching films. Okay. Um and yeah, and watching television programs. So we had been watching Deep Space Nine, and she pointed at this guy and I sort of like said, "That's him from the Dirty Harry film, right?" Um, which is how I remembered it was him from the. Oh, right, okay. That's him from the Dirty Harry film, 
Um, and he's playing um, one of these creatures in Star Trek that's got makeup and prosthetics all over the face. They've got sort of like wrinkly neck things going on. They've got stuff down the bridge of the nose and everything. And you wouldn't have been able to tell. It could have been any fucker under there. And she's going, it's in from Deep Space Nine. I am I I am DB'd it, and this is <laughs> it had been twenty years since she'd watched that Dirty Harry film, and it's just how the yeah talents we all have talents for you know yeah. your your wife is an incredible artist, and you know has such skills of details. I you know she makes dolls, doesn't she? She paints dolls up so they look like real babies, and that's painting faded veins on the side of a temple so it looks like the blue is seen through a yeah. translucent you know uh, epidermis that's it's a skill that i can't even imagine how you possibly do that so she obviously has this eye for acute details that well, that is beyond yeah. <laughs> beyond me and you <laughs> yeah because i mean it's taken me till now to remember oh my god that's where i've seen him from before yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's something vaguely familiar about his face. Yeah. yeah. And actually, I only really knew that about the Dirty Harry thing because I read about it. I didn't look at it and think, oh, that's him from Dirty Harry. You know. <laughs> Another yeah. interesting thing about this film, did you notice how it changed countries? No. All right. It starts off in Britain. It right. kind of ends in Britain as well. It's a sort of way because it's definitely Britain, actually, that the big flying thing nicks the box off the bo bonfire from, right? Right. But part of the way through, there are American cops that look around the house. Didn't even notice that. No, it's really odd, isn't it? That's because the money ran out and the American company, New, New Line Cinema came in, and they, but on the insistence that the actual thing took, part, took place in America rather than in Britain. And it already filmed most of the film. <laughs> So they put American cops in it just to try and play with the schema. That's why it doesn't state any, never says where they are, where they live. It's all really kind of ambiguous in the way that it's done. Um, but that didn't detract for me. Um, um, things like that normally trip me up and it's just hang about. I'm, yeah, I'm no longer invested in this. But That's how good it is. Yeah, and I think because it's... Right, and, this makes me sound warped, but it's such a sexy film. Mm. It's all about the sexiness, the sexiness of um, the BDSM lifestyle that this bloke's been living, the sexiness of this woman's promiscuity and her openness to the adultery. Um, yeah, everything about mm. it, just sexy and se Yeah, um, all the bodily fluids that are up in the attic. Yep. Even down to say the violence itself is presented in a very sexual way. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like, uh, I often say this about the book American Psycho, is one of the clever bits about that book is the way that he runs between, particularly towards the end of the book, there are scenes where he's writing in erotica and you're kind of going, oh, yeah, this is quite nice. And then as you turn the page, it turns into utter violence. Yeah. And it never does it on the same page. You always have to do it as a page turn. So you get the, the suddenness of it. And I think this does the same thing. It presents a load of stuff that is just grotesque and you shouldn't have the slightest turn on for, but it's done in such a way that you kind of feel dirty because there is a turn on about it and you're trying to roll back on it, you know, to go, no, you know, he's, he's got hooks in his face and he says, Jesus wept, which is just, one of the great lines, greatest lines in horror movies. And then he just gets obliterated. But that point when he's got all those hooks out of him and he's pulling that away, this it's so sensual. There's so many senses that you yeah. can see going on there that you can kind of almost go, it's the absolute extreme. I was reading the Wikipedia page and I think it got it wrong. It says that the Cenobites don't know the difference between pain and pleasure. And I think they've got that wrong because the whole point is that they blur the lines between pain and pleasure, that they take it to the so to the extreme that it's impossible to tell the difference between hell and heaven in that particular moment. That would make sense, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, Wikipedia pages are useful. They've got their place. I'm never going to criticise Wikipedia pages. Um, I feel like a James Bond villain here with this dog asleep on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
They she will have your son for chitzel. Um, yeah, um, yeah, it's funny you should use the word dirty because, again, that was one of the things that seemed to characterize evil in that. The yeah, that, um, when we're first introduced to Tim, um, we see that his fingers look like he's been um, fisting a smoke monster. Yes, um, he's just sort of like under his nails is filthy, his fingers are cracked. Um, yeah, you just get the impression that this guy stinks. Yeah. He's so involved in the pursuit of pleasure at the expense of his own self. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that you're right. I mean, that's visually portrayed so well. Yeah, it really is. Um, and as going back to the special effects, for their day, the special effects were good. But yes. even now looking at them, we're not sort of nowadays it would probably have been CGI to buggery. Yeah. Um, and this seems somehow more visceral than the CGI. Yeah, Frank. Yeah, I, mean, oh, I, I just got his what... name there, Frank. Yeah, I don't know whether I'm sounding like one of these wankers that goes on about how oh, vinyl, vinyl's much better than all this. No, stuff. no, because everything has its place. It's like if you're making that today, I would say you need to use it both. I mean, there are moments where CGI could be used just to tidy it up a little bit. You know, I mean, I say the reason I thought Frank, because do you remember Network 7? No. All right, Sunday morning television program used to be on Sunday mornings on Channel 4. And they had the animatronics of the head of Tim. Right. right. And I just remember because he was programmed again, one of the first. It was one of the first to have a fully articulated lips on the puppet. So he says, Frank, he does that. Fur. He gets the whole shape done properly and they just had the thing there going frank frank you know like that so it was all sort of puppeted in that way um yeah and i think there's i mean the flying thing at the end would probably benefit from a bit of cgi although i like the fact it exists in as a physical thing that they're in front of when it flies away it could have probably benefited from a bit of a cleanup. But apart from that, the way that the effects are done, it is it's full makeup, isn't it? It's a full makeup effect. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why it works so well. And it, because it is so physical and it has to be physical in that way. You know, you couldn't have someone walking around in a blue suit and then all the pins being put in digitally afterwards. It would never work like that. No, it wouldn't. Um, and yeah, I think that that's another part of its appeal, that mm. rough readiness. It's almost like um without trying to um without trying to be too vulgar, it's almost like the realness of amateur porn against yes. the sexiness of um yeah airbrushed um Hollywood porn. It's a film that could quite easily have been ruined by having too much money to spend. Yeah. You know, it's the fact that it was on such a tight budget. And it became this kind of mother of invention. I mean, there were a couple of moments that it's of its time. You know, it's a very 80s film. Um, yeah, the film way that she looks. Be massive, yeah. Yeah. So, but, but, no, never take it away. I mean, the impact that film had on me when I first saw it. I saw that at the ABC in Brighton. And under, <laughs> funny enough, the we, we, I used to go to the cinema so much. I used to go every single week. And we were queuing up and we didn't know what we wanted to see. And there's only three screens and we couldn't decide, right? And hadn't heard of any of the films that were on. And it was the guy that I knew at the cinema. He sort of just went, go see Hellraiser. So it's a British horror film. Go see, right? Go, just go see it. We were like, All right, we'll go see that. <laughs> Blew my socks off. I hadn't seen anything like it. You know, actually, I'll, I'll even go as far as saying as I don't really think I've seen anything like it since. I don't think any of the sequels have really captured it. In, in what that film did. I mean, Hellraiser 2 is just mad. You know, it's a proper um, acid trip of a film. And I still, to this day, cannot decide whether I enjoyed it or not. You know, there's so much about it I like, but there's so much about it that's also, you know, a bit naff. But Hellraiser, nah, is that's i got to say, Hellraiser... We spoke about the changing last time that we were on, and I said that's that's one of my top favorite films of all time. Hellraiser's up there with it, the, you know, because it does it's so different, um, yet it hits the right tropes, it, it, like you were saying. And I hadn't really thought about the moralistic side of it as much, but yeah, 
a true killing film, a film that involves lots of killing, yeah, has to have the moralistic side of things. It's almost like it can morally justify the destruction of the, the creatures at the end because they've already been, you know, there's a justification behind every single killing in it. And that's what makes it enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. Really, really liked it. So Hellraiser 2, I'm not even sure I've seen it. Do you reckon it's worth me dipping into that? Uh, yeah, it's definitely worth watching. Um, there's a couple of, we have a couple of connections, actually. I met Doug Bradley. I went for a drink with Doug Bradley in London. Um, he's, Pinhead, yeah. he's the guy that plays Pinhead, yeah. Because I met him at a convention in Blackpool. And then I was trying to put a film project together. And I wanted him to play the devil. And he was up for it. And I had him attached to the project. You know, unfortunately, I couldn't raise the finances on it. But I went for a drink with him in London. Um, really nice fella. Really, really intelligent guy. And you should look up on YouTube just to listen to him read Edgar Allan Poe. Because he does read it very well. Yes, I'm going to have to. Yep. Yeah. Um, but also, we know a guy called Steve. Comes along to Magical Words. Um, guy in the wheelchair. Yes. He was an extra in Hellraiser 3. Shut the front door. Absolutely. There you go. So we have these connections. Wow. And and Clive Barker has a copy of Mathematical. Yes, I'm aware of this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of those odd ones. I know a, I know an artist who got hired. Sam, Mr. Uh, Sam, Mr. Sam, his name is. And uh, he got hired by Clive Barker to do some graphic. Um, they call them moving. What do they call them? They're like animated graphic novels. All right. So he did a load of work for those. And he, he actually had to go up and work at his house. So because it, because he knows me as a writer, he actually gifted Clive Barker a copy of my book, Mathematical. So there you go. So Clive Barker knows my name. Ooh. <laughs> so, yeah, that's impressive. That's really impressive. But Hellraiser 2, I'm going to say yes. Watch it, um, because it does complete the story that you'll find in Hellbound Heart, the the, uh, the novella, which I think we should read, so that we can get that A B comparison. But yeah, I would definitely have a have a good at it because um, it's not directed by Clive Barker. The second one, it has a wonderful reanimation sequence in it, which I think you'll really get. Right. It, definitely has a very Clive Barkerist about it, not in the way that it went on, where people just think just throw a load of gore and BDSM at something and it becomes a Clive Barker. You know, it, it's not quite the same as that. And it and it's um I think for its time it's quite innovative. It has a very in, some very, very interesting images on it. I don't want to say too much actually, because if you've not seen it, It'll be very, very interesting to see what you think about it. In fact, I'm almost going, let's push Hellbound Heart away and we'll talk about Hellraiser 2 next because it is a very interesting movie. It's a real kind of quirky film. That's right. it's there, yeah. I'm just downloading that now. Um, so um, Hellraiser 2022. No. Not that one. Not that one. <laughs> Not that one. I haven't seen that yet. And I do need to see that at some point. Um, but it's not that one. It's Hellraiser 2, Hell, uh, Hellbound. Hellbound, right? Hellbound. Hellbound. Hellbound, yeah. Yes. Um, so is that what we'll look at next week then? Yeah, I'll tell you what, let's do that. Because it's, I was going to say let's read Hellbound Heart as, as a thing. But I think with the love of Hellraiser that we both obviously have, which uh, for me started uh, a, a lifelong love affair with Clyde Barker's work. Um, I hadn't read his work before I'd seen Hellraiser. And then I've read an awful lot of it since I watched Hellraiser. I went back and found all the books of blood and I just, he, he is a poet when it comes to gore and yeah. oddities and the strange. Um, he finds the divine within, <laughs> he, he finds the divine within us. And I don't mean our souls. I mean, our sinews, you know, he actually <laughs> finds the divine within our actual mechanics as, as, uh, as flesh, as, as meat machines. Um, so yeah, let's do that. Let's, uh, let's have a look at that. 
and we'll can have that kind of comparison to how it works because it's a very interesting sequel in that it is a genuine sequel um it is not just a rehash of the first film it's a genuine continuation of the story right and i i like it i think i think that's how i end on it it's one of those movies that i think doesn't get the love it deserves but at the same time i don't think it deserves the love it's always that kind of weird one for me it's a very odd movie uh very very odd movie so from a creative point of view it'll be a very interesting discussion yeah i think so because um earlier this week i watched um winnie the pooh blood and honey i haven't seen that yet but there's someone whose opinion I semi trust, um, and he didn't like it very much. I didn't like it. Didn't like it at all. Um, the premise, the idea, it could have been brilliant. Yeah, it could have been an awful lot of fun. And um, instead, you've got acting that is so painfully wooden, it just spoils every scene that you're looking at. Um, you've got dialogue in there that is atrocious. It's almost as though they've taken amateur actors and said, improvise the lines. Uh, um, and then the amateur actors have just sort of like said, oh, please don't hurt me, please don't hurt me, please don't hurt me, please don't hurt me. And, yeah. Did any uh, of them go, well, at the beginning of their lines? Well, please don't hurt me. Or... <laughs> it's, it's, it starts off What's... in 100 Acre Woods. Yeah. And it turns into a slasher film with oh, a booby slipped out and yeah um which which i've got nothing against boobs in fact the sometimes they're my favorite things in the world but yeah i thought you were quite a fan i thought you were quite a fan you know you can tell when a film is sort of like just there for cheap titillation for want of a better word yes um, when you know within the first five minutes somebody's popped one out and it's just a case of well, even I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't mind a bit of exploitation, uh, but it, it's about whether or not it sits as a decent thing in that. I mean, we were talking, I was talking to my friend Mick about music, and uh, and I, I'll say this all along the line. I have this thing that I call the Bonkers Brigade, where because I'm a I'm a weird person, right? I know you've noticed this. Who's been said? Who's been saying that, mate? <laughs> Tell me um, now. It's, it's to the point where you you say things and you don't think they're weird, and it's not until you realise that everyone in the room is looking at you with a slightly tilted head that you might have said something a bit weird. So the Bonkers Brigade are the people that think they're weird but aren't, but they do weird things because they think that's what weird is. Yes. Right? And so you get banned. So I can listen to music that most people would sit down and go, that is absolute shit. Right. And I go, yeah, but if you listen to it, you can find you can find the creativity in it and all that kind of stuff. And then you get other bands that are just shit. They've been deliberately going out to be rubbish because they think it's ironic. Oh, look at us, we're being rubbish, you know, because you're not there's no creativity in that. They're just it's doing that sort of thing. So it sounds like you get a really good exploitation movie, like Cockneys versus Zombies, for example. It's a pure exploitation yeah. movie. But it's brilliant. It's absolutely yeah. on the nose. Uh, Cocaine Bear, right, is another one that is just, it's its obviously an exploitation movie, um, but it's really good fun. It works. And what Simon was saying about and what it sounds like you're saying is they've got this little premise. And they obviously made a short film of Winnie the Pooh. Is it, what, what if Winnie the Pooh was a serial killer? Right in the and gone mad in the Hundred Maker Woods because Christopher Robin hadn't been around. What would happen? We don't need to pay copyright anymore because he's dropped out of copyright. So what can we do with this? Um, and they came up with this premise that, of course, a load of people objected to. But instead of actually sitting down and going, how do we make this into even even mocking the slasher genre? You know, we want to mock the Winnie the Pooh stuff and we want to mock the slasher genre. That they just went. Oh no, we'll just have a load of violence in it and not really. It sounds like it's not made by people that actually have a love for the genre. Uh, because it just it doesn't hit any of the right notes. No, it it didn't no. Um there were some parts where it sort of like talks about the history and explains how Pooh is sentient, and you think, oh, all right, yeah, I can maybe get on board with this. Those parts were actually animated. 
um, which shows that there was some level of budget to this. But you look at the wooden levels of acting that are in there, and and yeah, they're just fucking atrocious. Mm. Yeah. It's that whole guy, and, and funny enough, going back to just bring it back on Hellraiser, Hellraiser has issues with a couple of little bits of acting in it, especially the, the one of the guys she picks up, I think, is a little bit dodgy. And the, the fact that the American police turn up and there's these errors, but you yeah. don't care because the film, the plot, the characters. And like I've always said, I, I you know me, when we talk about plot and character, that I actually think you can you can get away with certain things if you've got other bits right. And I think the characterizations in that in Hellraiser is what pulls it through. She is so evil that it really carries it through. They're so and they're, and they're so beautifully realized, the main characters in it. That you you know I fully totally agree. It's yeah. like when I was watching Buffy, there are parts in Buffy where you yes. go back and watching it now and you sort of like some of the special effects are fucking horrific. Yes. I mean, you've got Seth Green as a werewolf, and instead of it being a cost, he's just there in a onesie. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, one yeah. of the worst werewolves. You sit there and think, God, it may, it actually makes Lon Chaney Jr. look like Jurassic Park. You know, it's... But at the same time, you forget <laughs> it, because yes. Seth Green has just been fucking awesome as Oz. Yes. And he's there, and he's wonderful, and you'd like him, and he's had this werewolf thing thrown on him, and he's so good for the rest of the team, and the rest of it is just so powerful that, yeah. I mean, even Spike's accent, which sort of like travels more over the UK in a single episode than I've managed in a lifetime. Um, <laughs> it's yeah, be, be more around the, than, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And that's why, so that's why I kind of now move more towards character than story in being, a, I mean, story's great. Story's good. Story has to, you know, if you can get a good story, but if you, you can have the best story in the world, but if your characters are terrible, you're not going to grab people. You're not going to drag them through it. And I think I've watched more dreadful stories with really good characters than anything else in that way because of, because of you know, that, uh, that, you know, good characters. That's what you want. Yeah, absolutely. Every time it's got yeah. to be, yeah, it's got to be down to character. Well, let's see how these characters develop in Hellraiser 2. Because I, I'm really now interested, really, really interested in what your opinion of this is. Um, right, yeah, I think that's going to be um, tonight's um, televisual entertainment. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yes. this has been fantastic, Ash, as always. Um, but yeah, absolutely brilliant conversation. I love these. We, I'd like to say, I'll get my head out my ass, and these will become more regular again at those particular points. Uh. Right. Looking forward to it. Yes. Yeah. Looking forward to it. And that was, yeah, that was excellent. Thank you, mate. Brilliant. All right then, mate. Well, like, and subscribe and other kind of rubbish things. Um, and then I might show you my horror shelf. I now actually have a horror shelf. Look. Ooh. Yeah. So I might show you what's on the horror shelf at some point. If we get subscribers, I don't, you know, we don't know. Maybe anyways, anyway, but that was brilliant. So thanks a lot, Ash. Cheers, All right. mate. Take care. See you later. Bye. Bye.